Life is not like water. Things in life don't necessarily flow over the shortest possible route. A traffic jam. Everyday routine. Janicek's Sinfonietta. A young lady in rush. And a simple warning. Things are not what they seem. But don't let appearances fool you. There's always only one reality. What seems to be a random quote is nothing more than a hint for the readers by Haruki Murakami himself. This book will be nothing less than unusual. In case you haven't read 1Q84 yet, you are invited to join the first minutes and then leave once I enter the spoiler part. Or should I say, you are welcome to climb the ladder in one or the other direction. Welcome to 1Q84. The year is 1984 and the city is Tokyo. A young woman named Aomame sits in a taxi and is on her way to an important mission. As she and the driver are stuck in a traffic jam, he suggests her to leave the car and take his security letter to leave the expressway. Our mama agrees to do so, as she doesn't have any other choice. She needs to attend her meeting. Before she leaves, the driver leaves her the hint, things are not what they seem, but don't let appearances fool you. There's always only one reality. Once she has climbed down the ladder, things to be different, but still familiar. First hints are important news that seems to have happened a few months ago, but our mama can't even remember that she ever read about these in the media. She begins to explore, digs deeper and finally looks up to the sky to find the biggest difference in the world that she has entered through the ladder. Two moons. The one that we know and a smaller green one. And then there's Tango. Tango is a math teacher and writes in his free time. When his friend Komatsu asks him to rewrite a whole book, initially created by the young girl Fukaeri, he finds himself trapped in a maze of shady affairs and relations. It is not clear if Tango is located in the same reality as Aomame, but this will be discovered soon. Our mama names her new world with the two moons 1Q84 for a good reason. It is 1984, but not in her reality. This universe feels different from the ordinary and as she is not sure where she finds herself exactly, she names it 1Q84. Q for question mark. That's what I will call this new world, our mama decides, explaining Q is for question mark. Interesting fact, in Japanese, Q means nine. I'm not spoiling the story if I'm telling you that our mama and Tango are connected. It is obvious from the beginning. Murakami's goal is not to offer a story that is heading for an ultimate climax, even if 1Q84 has a climax, or better to say, several climaxes. He wants to kidnap us into another world. And again, this world is not a whole new universe or planet or something we know from science fiction. This world is our world, combined with some supernatural extras. Some of these extras have a meaning and some don't. It is a world written by a realistic dreamer. And if we as readers dig deeper, we will find a meaning. Not a meaning created by the novelist himself, but a personal meaning for us. Each reader has a different interpretation and this is what makes 1Q84 and Murakami's books in general so special. It is no message that is taught us with a sledgehammer approach. It is the gate that opens up in our own mind to create our own life lessons that we learn from his stories.
Let's for example take a look on the two moons. Some say that Murakami questions all aspects of reality, that he is asking the question of how do we really know that there aren't really two moons in the sky, just because scientists say so. But I don't see any conspiracy here. I think that 1Q84 is a wonderful love story. My feeling is that once Tengo and Aomame enter 1Q84, both their souls are mirrored in the sky. One big moon characterizes the muscular Tengo. The smaller green one is Aomame. Aomame means green pea. A short phrase in 1Q84 vaguely says, Moon is lonely in the sky and is now joined by another moon. Don't you think that Tango has been joined by Aomame once she entered the new world? And isn't it the ultimate goal that these two moons become one again? The journey until then is full of dangers, challenges, lovely and horrible characters and unusual happenings. There we have Fukaeri, the mysterious girl that has written Air Chrysalis and shocks Tango's daily life. On the other hand we have the old lady, our mom's mentor and also her commissioner for contract kills. She is joined by my favorite character Tamaru, a ruthless but still adorable security expert. Even if not an official friend, he is one of our mama's closest. And in her world full of shady characters, trials and tribulations, she needs friends. When Tengu rewrites a chrysalis, he does nothing more than restoring Fukaedi's background. Fukaeri is the daughter of a mysterious leader, the head of a cult. He can hear the voices of the little people, a group of... I don't know how to call them. The little people are there and again, they don't exist. They appear whenever they want and they seem to have great knowledge and are owners of great power. The leader is their voice and he has brutal methods of acting those out. Methods that shake other people. Methods he should be punished for. And his punishment is one of the many climaxes of the story. Novels don't have to follow any rules or have to be ordinary. They have to be readable. And that is 1Q84, which has more than 1,500 pages. These pages must be mastered by both the novelist and the reader. However, its scope is not noticeable in 1Q84. Murakami never lapses into the haste that often occurs in large novels when a writer runs out of patience with his own work. And in doing so, Murakami, despite his unpretentious, sometimes even sluggish and redundant style, does service for his readers. His repetitions and endless loops do not deserve this time, but they stress us. The story takes all the time in the world, and we follow it with patience and attentions that great works deserve. A patience that we need to grant, even if it feels painful. We as the readers become Murakami's slaves. Each chapter is written from the point of view of Tengo or Aomame. They don't meet once during the story, but the text moves more and more towards their meeting. And while we can't wait anymore for the ultimate encounter, we are faced with one major problem. Sexuality. While Aomame is indeed a strong female character, she is still sexualized. There are too many passages that concentrate on her intimate body sites and the story does not benefit from these passages. The same problem happens with other female characters. These descriptions are extensive but not important. Despite that, there are other sexual passages that are important again, just to name Tango's paralyzed sexual encounter that is essential for the story. 
But did we really need the repetitive descriptions of female and male private parts? As the story is partly written from our mama's female perspective, do we really need to think that women talk like this about their breasts? Which comes back to the question, what is normal in 1Q84? And are these sexual passages a reason to quit the book? Or do people like Ushikawa, the mystery of the two moons and the haunting love story of Tengo and Aomame mesmerize us and do not allow us to close this book for too long? Is this the unbearable greatness of 1Q84? What remains at the end is a silent pain in my chest. Tango and Aomame were my closest friends in the past weeks. I didn't need to look up into the sky because every time I opened 1Q84 I knew that there were two moons. This world became my daily routine because of its extensive size. And I'm happy and sad at the same time that there is only one moon left. Sad for me because the book is finished. Happy for our mama and Tango because they are one now. The extensive size, the so resulting routine, the associated pain, the beautiful ending and the remaining emptiness in my chest is what I call the unbearable greatness of 1Q84. Thank you.